Watch ABC News Live right now and anytime. Streaming on Roku, Hulu, Facebook, and abcnews.com. Live from ABC News, the State of the Union, and the Democratic response. Hello, everyone. I'm Terry Moran here at ABC News headquarters in New York, and we are going to be previewing the State of the Union, President Donald Trump's third State of the Union. It comes at a fascinating time for him and for the country. A moment of high drama. President Trump will step before the Congress that has impeached him, the House that has impeached him, and the Senate that is on the verge of acquitting him. That vote's scheduled tomorrow at 4 p.m., and it looks all but certain that he's going to be substantially acquitted with the Republicans uh, to a person voting to acquit there, it looks like. There might be a little bit of mystery in it, but probably not. So, he's got a story to tell. Is he going to, is he going to tell it antagonistically? Is he going to dance on the Democrats? Or is he going to look forward to the next big chapter, the 2020 election? Presidents traditionally use this stage, this national stage, to set the terms of their re-election campaign and re-election years. Let's go uh, to our team down in Washington in the Capitol. John Carl covering the White House for us. Mary Bruce, the Congress. John, let me go to you first. What are we expecting? I know you've heard a lot from the White House about what the president wants to accomplish tonight. So what are we looking for? Well, the White House officials say that he does not intend to speak about impeachment. Frankly, Terry, I find that to be a little surprising, and I wouldn't be surprised if there was a little bit of ad-libbing if it's not in his prepared remarks. But overall, officials say he is going to strike a tone of, and I'm going to read this verbatim, this is from a senior White House official, he is going to lay out a vision of relentless optimism. Uh, Donald Trump uh, is what that's what uh, officials at the White House say he will do. They're saying this will be a uh, an, an address that basically sets the tone for his reelection campaign and talks about the accomplishments uh, that have happened under his watch, including obviously the economy. He'll talk about the trade agreement with Mexico and Canada that was signed uh, last month. And he uh, officials insist he will be optimistic and forward looking. And that is uh, a very typical. He's got a good story to tell, but his audience is immediately immediate audience in that chamber, as I say, the Democrats who impeached him tried to kick him out of office through the most drastic remedy that the Constitution has, impeachment, and the Republicans who have protected him from that. So, Mary Bruce covering the Congress force, what, what are we going to see from the audience? Are we going to, first, are we going to see everybody? Is everybody going to show up there? Well, look, while it is not clear if the president's going to address the elephant in the room, what is clear is it's going to be pretty awkward in the chamber. As you mentioned, the president will be standing there speaking to Democrats who now have impeached him and to senators who in less than 24 hours are going to face that decision of whether or not to remove the president from office. Now, there are going to be some who simply are not showing up in protest. About a dozen Democrats uh, have said they don't plan on coming because, uh, in their words, they essentially don't want to dignify the president's behavior uh, by er, and condoning it by showing up. One Congresswoman, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, saying that she doesn't want to normalize the president's lawless conduct. Uh, also, some chairs that will be empty are those who who are trying to replace the president out on the campaign trail. Senators Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Amy Klobuchar, they are all now uh, attending to some other uh, breaking news uh, uh, over the last 24 hours, and they are out in New Hampshire uh, working the campaign trail. So there are some who will be missing, but remember, it's not just that it will be awkward, perhaps, between Democrats, but also that there are a growing number of Republicans who the president will be facing who, in the last couple days, have come out and said, while they don't think what the president did was impeachable, they also don't think it was right and appropriate. Either. And, Ter and Terry, keep in mind, he's going to be over his left shoulder. He will have Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. Uh, Speaker Pelosi and President Trump have not spoken to each other since the middle of October. And that was uh, didn't exactly go very well. No, uh, no. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the meeting at the White House where Nancy Pelosi stood up and walked out uh, uh, on the president. They have not spoken, not in person, not over the phone, in uh, since the uh, middle of October. And it was a year ago at that last State of the Union address where Nancy Pelosi wearing white, as I understand she will be tonight, the suffragist color, with that kind of smirking, clapping motion that uh, that she had that was caught on camera. Uh, this this year, John, it, it it does look like the president's got the got the whip hand here. He's he's in the he's he's in charge. 
Well, Terry, uh, you can look at this past month. The much of it was consumed with a an impeachment trial uh, dealing with his fate, and yet uh, many White House officials look at the month of January and say it was one of the best months of the Trump presidency. Uh, he mentioned that the trade deal, uh, you know, the trade deal I mentioned earlier that was signed, uh, the economy doing well, uh, taking out uh, uh, Qasem Soleimani, the the Iranian uh, leader. Uh, they believe that they've had a great month, and now uh, coming into this. Which, which is obviously ironic, given that so much of it was tied up into this impeachment trial, with Democrats making the case that he needs to be removed from office because he is a threat to the nation. But uh, he feels like he's coming into this uh, feeling quite good. All right, John Carl and Mary Bruce, you'll be up there for the big speech. It's a long one. Uh, <laughs> buckle in. Thanks very much. All right. And here in New York, I'm joined by... Uh, Nightline co-anchor and veteran reporter and good friend Byron Pitts is with us. So, Byron, uh, we're hearing from John and Mary. He's got a good story to tell at sure. a very, very dramatic and strange time. He's being impeached and he's going to claim victory. Now, you and I both have covered a number of these speeches from a number of presidents. And I was just thinking, I can't think of a time where there's been more drama on the evening. So many different storylines going on. All the ones that, that, that you so eloquently laid out. And, and you wonder which one of those will he touch upon. And thinking back, think of all the major speeches that President Trump has given. I can't think of one where he didn't take the opportunity to poke at his adversaries. And going in tonight, he has good ammunition. I think by, by most accounts, what happened in Iowa last night was a disaster for the Democrats, right? He's not gonna be able to resist dunking uh, on that. Exactly, I mean, it's, it's, it's it, I mean, late, late night comics. All, I mean, they had one job. Right? He had one job, had Down four years to do it, and he didn't get it right. So you would seem like he's gonna lean in there. As you laid out, we certainly know the outcome of the, of the vote tomorrow. Uh, it's hard to see this president missing the opportunity to poke fun at that. And again, because the people who came after him, many of them will, will be in the room, looking him in the eye. And they'll know that in the end, they didn't get where they wanted to get, and he survived. As you mentioned, over his shoulder is someone who is clearly, not just on different sides of the aisle, but just philosophically, emotionally, uh, opposed. Like, I think most people would argue they probably don't like each other, mm. and, and they'll be in proximity. Uh, you just, I mean, certainly how, how meaningful it might be with, with all the, the issues going on in the world, with the coronavirus, different challenges, issues going on on the Wall Street, but this president does have good things he can, he can stick with, and, and how wonderful it might be in this giving the state of our union, that he would, could give this unifying speech that, yes, there are these challenges around the world, but look at all the good things that we have accomplished mm. as a nation. But that's not his style. It's not his style, but you're right. If he's ever going to do it, it's this moment. Now, the Democrats can't let him because he's sailing towards a re-election, he thinks, given sure. what the economy is and previous presidents with a good economy have done pretty well. But I think that this would be the hinge for him to turn that corner. Not like <laughs> Right? You and I, because we've talked about such things, right? And you, and, and you always, you and I both know, you've, that there oftentimes there are moments where the leader of the free world, the president, rises to the occasion and does something that, that friends and foe will go, ha. Huh. Right. That's not been his style, and there's no expert. Because I was thinking about uh, looking at what happened yesterday, with the, not just that there were mistakes made in, in either glitches, but this fact that for four years we've been hearing, or for, for several years we've been hearing, that the Democrats are energized to take on this president. Energized, disciplined, ready to go. And in Iowa, we didn't see a record turnout. Right. There were these technical problems that you don't see. If you're really, if you're really ready for prime time, you're going to get this right. And so, so does he use that to say, "See, I told you these people aren't worthy of me," or does he say, "You know what? Let's all move forward together." The, you know, I, I've, I've had these successes. They're, they've had some glitches. Just as a reminder that perhaps this is my time, we're going in the right direction. And, and to you all who are struggling, I mean, he, he can use it to his advantage. You all who've had a bad 24 <laughs> hours, come with me. There's room in my tent. Yeah. Across the political aisle. I don't know, but, but you never know because let's, let's talk about the scene there. That chamber, that grand chamber, we're looking outside, but the grand chamber uh, of the House of Representatives where the Senate comes to join, the cabinet is there, the president and the speaker of the House and the vice president up there. Also, 
members of the Supreme Court. Let's go to Devin Dwyer, who tracks the Supreme Court. Uh, I know because I rely and work with Devin on that subject from time to time. So, Devin, this has become a controversy over the years. Which justices are going to show up? And, and, and increasingly fewer and fewer do because it does feel like a political event they don't want to be part of. But what can you tell us about the justices who are going to be there? Yeah, it sure does, Terry. This is one of the more uncomfortable events that the, the Supreme Court justices participate in each year. You and I have both heard it from members of the Supreme Court. This year, we're told by the court that Chief Justice will be in attendance, along with Elena Kagan, representing the court's liberal wing, uh, and then President Trump's two appointees to the court. Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh will be there front and center as well. Both of them uh, were here last time. Now, these justices have such mixed feelings about being there. This goes back to Antonin Scalia, of course, who you covered very closely, Terry. He called this uh, a childish spectacle every year and stuck his nose up at it. Antonin, uh, rather, Justice uh, Alito said it's like having to sit like a potted plant without uh, giving any expression. And he struggled with that from time to time, responding to some of President Obama's speeches. Uh, but I'm really going to be watching closely Chief Justice John Roberts tonight because he is not only the chief justice of an entire branch of government, but he's still technically presiding over the trial, as you say, uh, of President Trump. So he's actually still um, leading that effort, and he's going to be uh, you know, convening the court later next month uh, to decide on whether subpoenas in three separate cases for President Trump's financial records uh, should be upheld, and that whether the president himself, the man who will be staring him in the eye tonight, will eventually have to turn over those tax returns. So it's always a difficult position for those justices to be in, uh, and it's great uh, body language watching tonight, uh, uh, among all the other things we'll be looking at as the speech goes on. There was that famous incident, Devin, when uh, President Barack Obama castigated the Supreme Court from that dais Citizens from United. The, on Citizens United, saying it was a wrongly decided case. And Justice Samuel Alito shook his head and said, no, no, that's wrong, and got in trouble for it. He's not showing up tonight. He, he, that's right. And he, he has said that that was a moment that burned him, that he wanted to stay out of the spotlight like so many of them do. Um, but I've heard from Justice Kavanaugh, who has talked publicly about feeling like this is the Super Bowl of politics of American government. He feels a responsibility to represent the judiciary in that chamber. He likes being there, he has said uh, in his speeches. And so he's one of the more smiley members of that court, uh, at least for the opening ceremonies. But the president, <clears throat> Terry, you can expect will reference the court tonight. He has um, talked a lot in his presidential campaign and his re-election campaign about those two uh, appointments to the court and, as you know, appointing more federal judges to the bench than any other president at this point right. in his first term. So a lot to talk about with the judiciary. A lot of, a lot of help from Mitch McConnell there. Devin, thanks very much. Let's go uh, to one of the members who will be listening to the president tonight. Congressman Joaquin Castro representing Texas's 20th congressional district. That's San Antonio. If he looks familiar, is Swin brother ran for president, was running for president as well. Congressman, thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. And so this is a president, do you agree or disagree, coming to the Congress sort of on, a, on the crest of, uh, of a wave? It looks like impeachment is not going to work for the Democrats. He's not going to be removed from office. He's got a pretty good economy. Uh, what do you expect from the president? How do you judge how he enters the, the, the chamber there? his status before the American people. Well, that's certainly one way to put it. Uh, I would put it a little bit of a different way, which is this is a president who is among a few presidents in American history to be impeached. So he comes into this chamber tonight uh, under a cloud because of that. Uh, and, you know, uh, usually in these speeches, presidents will take credit for uh, how well the economy is doing, for international affairs. But this is a president who comes in with many challenges there also. Uh, income inequality has grown. Uh, he's shepherded a tax bill that helped only the wealthiest Americans. His foreign policy has been a very chaotic one. Uh, and so you know, you've got a Congress, I think, uh, that is very suspect of many of the president's priorities and his policies. Can I ask you about morale in the Democratic caucus, given what President Trump will say is his, you know, his defeat of uh, an unwarranted impeachment, his good economy, and then the Iowa caucus mess last night. Uh, it has morale among the Democrats, your colleagues? 
It's fine. I mean, look, the years under this administration have been intense for many reasons. President Trump has one of, been one of the most divisive presidents in American history, and that has weighed, I think, pretty heavily uh, on many members of Congress. Uh, so in that sense, it, it has been quite intense. But in terms of our outlook uh, and what's on the horizon, I think we've been very positive um, and, and I think are very bullish about the coming months. Hmm. I want to ask you one more question. You know, we watch these states, the State of the Union addresses, and uh, one side rises in a in North Korean style applause 25, 30 times. Uh, the other side sits on its hands most of the time. That'll happen again tonight. What's your feeling? Because the American people, kind of, I think, by and large, polls show would like uh, more, more comity, more bipartisanship in Congress. How do you feel about your fellow Republicans? Uh, in that house. I know what it'll look like, but do you, do you feel like you can do any business across that partisan divide? Yeah, you know, uh, the issues that get the most coverage are the issues where Congress is very divided along party lines. But there are things that happen here every week where people are actually in agreement. And there are areas of overlap where I think we can still work together. Uh, and hopefully we'll have a chance to do some of that in 2020. You know, let me ask you, so what would you say is the last thing you worked on that you felt good about working with Republicans? Well, I mean, I'm working on bills all the time that are bipartisan bills, and I think that's the case for all of us. For example, I'm on the Foreign Affairs Committee and have a few bills, at least, that have co-sponsors that are Republicans. Uh, I've done work with, for example, Mark Meadows on, on voting uh, around the world, um, and he's, of course, he was head of the Tea Party. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on around here uh, that's actually bipartisan. It's just not covered in the same way that many of the big issues are. And, and that's on us, Congressman Joaquin. Castro, a little good news tonight. Thanks very much. Thank you. So let's uh, let's go back out. Let's go out on the campaign trail right now. After that uh, mess in Iowa, as you probably know, the Iowa caucus just melted down cons completely. No results were reported at all for close to 24 hours, and still not even two thirds have been reported. Our Whit Johnson is with Bernie Sanders up in New Hampshire. They've all gone from Iowa to New Hampshire. Bernie Sanders has a right to be in the Senate chamber as a United States senator, but he's up there in New Hampshire. Well, Whit, what's the fallout from Iowa and uh, the, the president seizing the spotlight tonight? What's Bernie Sanders doing? Well, uh, Terry, he actually just wrapped up a huge rally right here. Hundreds of people very excited to see him. And despite the frustration, despite the mess out of Iowa, they are energized. They're motivated. They're excited about those preliminary results that are coming through. Bernie Sanders himself came up on the stage and said that he got more votes in the first and second round in Iowa than any other candidate. But as we know, it is neck and neck with Pete Buttigieg, who is also claiming a win out of Iowa. So there is certainly, certainly that level of uncertainty. And Bernie Sanders unable to claim that full victory that they really wanted coming here to New Hampshire. That said, looking forward, of course, the State of the Union is tonight, which you've been talking about, and Bernie Sanders is actually skipping that, and he has his own response that he'll be putting out later tonight after the president speaks. Now, this is not the first time that he's done it, but it is the first time that he's doing it while he's running for president. And we do expect to hear some of the things that he said on his stump speech earlier tonight, things like President Trump is not above the law. And he will reference that impeachment vote because after all this wraps up tonight, tomorrow, Bernie Sanders has to head back to Washington to be there to vote on impeachment against President Trump. Terry. That's right. With there'll be an exodus of senators from New Hampshire uh, as the four who are running uh, end up back in Washington to cast that vote. Thanks very much. Uh, let's go to. Uh, Martha Raddatz, my colleague, and who was my host for the Super Bowl party as well, Martha. <laughs> so You can talk about football, though, Terry, not me. Well, it was great. It was a great party, I'll tell you that. And I want to ask about foreign policy. So the president's got a State of the Union. Uh, I don't know how much of it is going to be de dedicated to foreign policy, but what kind of a story do you think he has to tell on that? Well, well I think one thing is clear. <clears throat> there won't be a lot about foreign policy. There wasn't a lot about foreign policy last year, but the story he can tell is uh, going after people who, as he said, shouldn't be alive today. Baghdadi, that was certainly a significant move on the part of President Trump and those who tracked him down over all these years, the head of ISIS. But we have today a report coming out of the Pentagon that, so far, it hasn't made much difference operationally or in command and control. And as John Carl mentioned, he'll certainly talk about Soleimani in Iran as well, although 
not much of a difference has been seen there in terms of what Iran is doing uh, through proxies. I mean, we had some Katusha rockets or mortars hitting in the green zone very recently. So I think what everybody will have an eye on is what comes next in those countries and what the president says about that. Uh, last year, he talked about North Korea and a good relationship he had, and that there had been no missiles, missile launches in 15 months. Well, in the past year, in 2019, there were about 15 or 19, 15 to 20 short-range missile launches coming out of North Korea. And you had a president last year, Terry, who said uh, they wanted to end uh, the endless wars, that great nations do not stay in endless wars. And if you look at the numbers uh, around some of the places where we are, they've been reduced somewhat in Afghanistan, uh, somewhat in Iraq at one point, and, and now they have sent in uh, more troops there. Mm. So we hear the president is about to leave the White House on his way to the Capitol. But let me ask you about the chamber. And there he is. We're taking a look at the picture. That's on the other side uh, of the White House. That is the that is the South Portico door. Security's coming out there and aides. So he'll be out with the First Lady shortly. There's the beast, as they call it. That's the, the Cadillac. Uh, Martha, you've written in that, haven't you? I have not ridden in that, Terry. I certainly have not ridden in that. But, I, but I've seen a lot of those motorcades go by yeah. uh, right down the street, because, as you know, we're just, uh, just a very short walk to the White House uh, here at ABC. But it is, it is quite a ride, and those who protect him on this historic night, really, whatever you think, whatever you're waiting to hear at the State of the Union, it, it is an incredible evening to see the President of the United States speak in front of Congress speak in front of the nation. Of course, I think tonight will be a little more of a campaign speech. I, I also love Terry. One of, one of my favorite things to watch is the uh, Joint Chiefs, uh, the chairman and all the heads of the uh, branches of the military. And when they walk in, uh, I can tell you from people who've done it in the past that it is not a real comfortable situation for any of them. Those are the people I like to watch clap, because they are only allowed to clap uh, when it has something to do with the truth. They have to stay away, especially in that chamber, uh, away from anything political. I know oftentimes they look like a bunch of grumpy old men, and indeed they are men uh, still, all, all of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, that could change someday as, as women work their way up through the ranks. Uh, but that is an interesting group to watch. We know, of course, that President Trump loves to talk about the military, uh, and some of his guests tonight uh, are, are veterans. and and military families. Uh, but that is something he will highlight as well. I'm quite certain he will highlight how much money has been spent on the military, how much he likes military. Of course, we also have this year the Space Force. Uh, that's something new he, he can talk about as well. All right, Martha, thanks very much for that. Uh, and we will continue to watch the South Portico there when the, when the president comes out. We'll show you. We do have the White House always uh, releases a few excerpts, some of the the quotes and the applause lines that he expects. The president tonight will say he's leading, quote, the great American comeback, as he puts it, uh, that his main goal when he came into office was to revive the U.S. economy. He'll also throw some red meat, uh, some, some, some lines that his base will no doubt uh, like, and you'll see standing ovations from the Republican side. He says, we will never let socialism destroy American health care. A dig at Bernie Sanders and the Democratic Party in gen general. And he also says the United States of America should be a sanctuary for law-abiding Americans, not criminal aliens. Uh, we were just talking foreign policy with Martha Raddatz. Uh, our Kira Phillips has just come back from a trip with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to Ukraine, in, in part, where she had a great interview with him. Kira joins us on the phone. And Kira, that was well-timed interview. Uh, Mike Pompeo, who is thrust right into the middle of the impeachment as it emerged that he was, according to witnesses, very much involved in the president's push for political investigations in Ukraine. And you talked to him about that. What do you say? Absolutely. I mean, Terry, that's why I wanted to go. This is why I wanted to have an exclusive interview with him, because he was the first 
uh, senior U.S. official to go to Ukraine since the impeachment trial began. And I wanted to be there with him. I wanted to see what he had to say. I wanted to see how he interacted with President Zelensky of Ukraine and other leaders. We were in London, Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. I mean, it was quite the trip, uh, Terry. I, I hadn't, you know, talked about the stands uh, since the Iraq uh, war, uh, even going back to Afghanistan. So I had to definitely refresh uh, my history lessons and also foreign policy and 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 what uh, what was behind this trip, you know, policy wise. But at the same time, Terry, as you well know, um, you know, it was what's been at the heart of this impeachment trial is the millions of dollars in American security assistance uh, sent to Ukraine. Um, and in the middle all of, of all of this, I mean, talking about the trip, getting ready for the trip, um, this manuscript uh, gets out, this book that John Bolton, uh, former national security advisor, has written. And I wanted to talk not only about uh, Pompeo's trip, but also uh, what had had come out, uh, what had leaked with regard to this manuscript. And in addition to that, I wanted to see if journalists in these countries, specifically in Ukraine, were talking about it as well. And I was quite surprised, Terry, to see that they had a lot of questions for us. They had a lot of questions for Secretary of State Pompeo. Um, and that that was very interested, interesting to me, because while President Trump has tried to play this down, uh, as well as Pompeo, uh, at, at many at many moments within um, this trip and and the interview, it was quite revealing to see how much interest there was mm. in the impeachment trial uh, and with regard to uh, Secretary Pompeo and what he was going to say as he made this trip. Well, you asked him point blank about uh, the the evidence that has come in in the impeachment trial and the revelations in John Bolton's apparently forthcoming uh, unpublished manuscript that that Pompeo was very much involved. And I was struck when you said, well, you, have you ever known John Bolton to be a, a, a liar? He, he had some interesting things to say. Let's let's take a listen to, to what Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, told our Kira Phillips. He writes about that you and he and Esper went to the Oval. Um, that he told the president, this is in, Ameri in America's interest to not withhold aid. He said that Esper said this defense relationship, we have gotten some really good benefits from it, notably military equipment manufactured in the US. Trump replied, Ukraine is a corrupt country. We're pissing away our money. Is that how you remember that meeting? You know, unlike others, I don't talk about conversations I had with the president, uh, but there were many meetings. I'll, I'll, we, we know this very clearly, right? I, I was an advocate for continuing to support what I was doing right here in Ukraine today. I continue to think uh, that there's good value for what we're doing you here. You wanted the Ukraine aid today. to get here. Absolutely. I, I very much Why? Did. Why was it so important to you at that time? Why, why did you fight for that and go to the president and say, we've got to get that aid to Ukraine? Hey, Kira, for the same reasons I just described to you in the beginning of our interview, uh, this is important to the United States of America. Uh, we have challenges here to freedom. We want to make sure democracy flourishes here. It's on the edge of the European opportunity. And now this country is firmly anchored in the West. And if we get it right, it'll be so for decades and for generations. So that is Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. And Kira, as I said, uh, he, he pushed away your question there on what actually happened. And he also basically called John Bolton a liar. He did. He, he did. He, he did not deny. Uh, and, I, and I asked him point blank, you know, are you, are you calling him a liar? Are you saying, have you ever known him not to be truthful? And he did not come forward and say uh, directly uh, that that <laughs> that they were always on the same page. Um, and you know what else I found interesting is that, you know, we had a chance to talk also outside of, of that interview, Terry. And I think that Secretary Pompeo is going to have a lot to say uh, as time goes on. I will not be surprised if we will learn a lot more as, as time goes on. But he is at this point uh, dedicated uh, to working uh, with the president, 
uh, on on specific issues uh, to improve relations, uh, to not only uh, help uh, get past uh, what they have been downplaying as as a uh, hoax, uh, an, uh, a trial that is not credible. Um, but I just. I have a, 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 a deep-seated feeling that we are going to learn a lot more as, as time moves on. All right, and he's certainly a survivor uh, in, a, in an administration full of turmoil and staff turnover. Uh, Mike Pompeo has been there from just about the beginning as director of CIA and then secretary of state. Kira, thanks very much. We're going to go to break for a moment. When we come back, we'll have more of our look ahead. There's the beast waiting for the president uh, to take President Trump to his third State of the Union address. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Friday night, February 7th, live, the first debate after Iowa, and the last debate right before New Hampshire votes. The time is now, and the stakes are high. Which Democrats will take to the stage? Who will emerge? And who will face this man in the 2020 election? The ABC debate, Friday night, February 7th, live at 8 Eastern, 7 Central, 5 Pacific, just days before New Hampshire votes on ABC and ABC News Live. And we certainly do say good morning, America. I hate it, people. A lot of smiles <laughs> around here this morning. We can feel it in here, people. We can feel it. Incredible. Stop. Woo! It up, it up. We're going to celebrate. We got it all. <laughs> A big morning in Times Square. So much excitement. It feel good, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's how I feel every morning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> Don't want to miss that. This is going to be good. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. It's a number one true crime podcast. There was a murder in central Ohio. The man who committed that crime once sat on death row, but now he's on the run. His name is Lester Eubanks. Now, listen as U.S. Marshals give stunning access in the manhunt to catch a fugitive. Those nine lives are running out, and we're going to catch up with Lester. Follow the clues. Can you help U.S. Marshals catch this killer? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen free now on Apple Podcasts. There is the president's vehicle, the president's limousine there, uh, waiting for him outside the south portico of the White House. It is just about a half an hour or so, actually 27 minutes and 45 seconds or so, until the president uh, will arrive at the Capitol for his State of the Union address. So he'll be leaving fairly shortly. And we want to talk a little bit about politics now with Byron Pitts. Uh, this Iowa caucus fiasco. It's a gift. The real winner of the Iowa caucus was Donald Trump. Oh, without question. Without question. I mean, it was, I mean, he couldn't have scripted it better. I know last night we were all working, preparing for the show, and, and in our business you always lay out several possible scenarios in which direction the story might go. Trust me, there was not a scenario for it. There'll be no numbers provided at all. Uh, I mean, it was stunning. I mean, it's, I mean, certainly we're all mindful in, in any industry there are mistakes, there are, you know, things that, but but to completely miss the mark. Uh, and, and, and the impact that it has on, on the candidates. You know, we, we've often talked in the past about the momentum, the mm. big mo the candidates need coming out of Iowa and that they work hard to earn. Well, that was, that was denied. You think about, you know, Mayor Pete and, and what, if in fact it turns out that he won the night, what it would have meant for him as this, you know, outsider two years ago to have come this far. Um, and and that now that moment's been missed. Certainly, I would think uh, pre if 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 President Trump was the biggest winner of last night, then you have to think uh, former Vice President Joe Biden is a close second, right? Because we're not talking about how 
Right. Exactly. Look at look at that. Look number. at those numbers. That's 62 percent of the precincts of the vote in, and uh, we don't know what the what the 38 mm -hmm. that's out mm -hmm. where they were. But so this is a partial result. We aren't calling a winner at all. Mm -hmm. But look where Biden is. And and for so long, everyone has said he's the favorite. He's the front runner. But as you, you, we're just talking about football in, in the break, and it's like you know when the when the polls come out at the beginning of football season, and they say Clemson's number one, Alabama's number one. But if you go zero and four, uh, uh, okay, we right. you may be great on paper. Right. So at some point, like, he has to start winning someplace. Right. I'm a Chicago Bears fan. There were people picking him for the Super Bowl at the beginning of the week. It was, it was painful that way. But let's go to Iowa. Our Tom Yamas, uh, one of the chief anchors here at, at our streaming channel, is out there. And, Tom, you were out there. Dig they're digging out from the rubble today. What did it look like? Well, it's still the biggest mystery in politics, uh, Terry, and it's now 24 hours since the voting got underway here in Iowa yesterday, and we still have no winner. 62%, as you as you mentioned, has been reported, but this is a debacle. And Tom Perez, the chairman of the DNC, has just released a statement. This is just in tonight, right here on ABC News Live, and he says this is never going to happen again. He says this is completely unacceptable. He also says they're never going to use the app that they used here in Iowa. There seems to be a coding problem with that app. There were actually two Two problems. There was a problem with the app and then the backup system. Uh, there was supposed to be a firewall, which was that they could phone in some of the results. Uh, but it turns out so many people were phoning in yesterday. There are more than 1,600 precincts all across the Hawkeye State that the phones got jammed up and people had to wait for hours. They were on hold forever. They just hung up. A and Terry, the Des Moines Register had an interesting Tom, story. Tom, I so just want to hold you the, there for the a second. The party decides, yeah, sure. The president and first lady entering the, the limousine there. We're just taking them as they get into the, the limousine and en route to the Capitol. Off they go. It's a short drive down Pennsylvania, down to the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, where the president will give his State of the Union address. But, Tom, I'm sorry I interrupted. Go on. No, it's okay. You actually remind me, looking at the president and the first lady, he won his caucus. Uh, he was declared the winner early in the night yesterday in the, in the Republican caucuses. But uh, again, back to the Democratic caucuses, it, the Des Moines Register had a very interesting sto story where they, they actually spoke to some precinct captains, people uh, in, in the rural parts of the state on the far western edges, eastern edges. They didn't even have smartphones. They couldn't even use the app. So from the get-go, they were going to phone in. And yet they were using this technology throughout the state. Um, the chair of the party here of the Iowa Democratic Party here said it was unacceptable. Uh, he apologized. But Terry, we're now more than 24 hours later and we still don't have results. They came out here uh, almost four hours ago with the 62% reported in. W where are the rest of the numbers? What's happened? And why should people have any faith in the system if we can't get those numbers? You were speaking with Byron. Obviously, the Republicans and, and the Trump campaign is going to seize on this. They're going to say the system is rigged. Uh, but it all plays into the Republican hands. And as you mentioned, it plays into Joe Biden's hands. And it's disappointing to all the people in Iowa who actually, the voters, who, who go to all these events, they would see the candidates, they'd go to their coffee shops, they'd go to their churches, they'd watch these candidates, try, try to listen to them speak and pick someone, and then all the volunteers and the staffers that worked for more than a year, because, Terry, you've covered the caucuses. You know it's the ground game here. It is so important. you got to have the ground game here, and, and now you have a headline that's unclear. Is it Sanders? Is it Mayor Pete? Mayor Pete should be riding that big mo into New Hampshire. He had a pretty good moment today. He got a little emotional. When, when sort of he realized he is somewhat victorious here, there in New Hampshire. And I'm sure he'll get a little bit of a bump. But now you have Joe Biden, and his whole his whole campaign is based on the fact, or at least the theory, because it's it's not a fact, that he's going to be electable, that electability is an issue. Well, guess what? you got to be elected to say you're electable. And so far right now, it looks like that's not the case with Joe Biden. It sure doesn't. And we're looking at the senators coming in, Ron Wyden there, Bob Menendez of New Jersey, Sherrod Brown of Ohio. Ohio and I, and Tom raised a great point Byron about the confidence that people need to have in the count yes and in this era of hacking and and uh, and doubt in institutions in general do you think this has an impact on on the trust that people have in the vote itself absolutely you know as we've often discussed, there's, for any person, anything, there's always a narrative, right? Anything that happens to reinforce a narrative 
So it, th there are concerns in our country about our election process, who gets to vote, what votes for counted. That, that's built into our DNA now as a nation. We have concerns about it. And so what happened in Iowa only reinforces that, that if, if we can't get if that the Democrats can't get it right for a few hundred thousand people in one state, why should we believe it's, it's, it's what's the old saying, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice? And, and so, yeah, I, I would think it, it, it for, for, you know, because so much of, of our nation, right, they, you know, they, they, they get engaged as they, as they need to. And if at the, the, at the passing, the engagement was, they got it wrong in Iowa, where there's some problems a couple years ago, why should I trust the process? Why should I participate in the process? And that, that is the, the evil genius, as it were, of what the Kremlin did to the United States uh, in 2016. Let's go to Yvette Simpson. We're happy to be joined by the CEO of Democracy for America, a progressive group. Uh, and Yvette, thanks for being with us. I wanted to ask you both about, uh, about the State of the Union, but first, this w subject we're talking about the debacle in Iowa. How do you read the impact uh, going forward? Big, small, what, 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 what difference will it make that this thing happens? I think the party is going to have a long overdue conversation about Iowa and whether it should be the first state, uh, about caucuses in general and whether they're the best way to make sure that everybody is represented. There's a lot of folks who were not able to engage in the caucus process and so that's another issue. Uh, voter integrity, making sure that we have paper that we have backups, uh, that we don't use new systems without testing them. Uh, and so that is kind of the conversation we're going to have, particularly with Nevada right around the corner, and they also have uh, a caucus format as well. And they got to get that right. And they've already said they aren't going to use that app. Yeah, they better not. Right? They better learn the lesson. But I do want to say, Terry, there was some good news coming out of Iowa, right? We had the largest group of first-time caucus goers, 35% first-time caucus goers. The number of young people tripled uh, over 2016 uh, who engaged in the caucus process. And so we're engaging younger voters, which we need to. That millennial population is large, and we need them to engage. And so there was some good news coming out. But I do think the Iowa Democratic Party, the DNC, needs to have a conversation one, about making sure that we have diversity in those early contests, and number two, making sure that we look at this caucus format and find out whether it is equitable, whether it is democratic, or whether we need to go to the primary format across all of the contests up until uh, into convention. And just taking a look at President Trump, how strong do you think he is coming for the country right now with the story that he wants to tell? You know, if you're, if you're Donald Trump, you never have a bad day. You have a perfect call. <laughs> everything's great. Everything's wonderful. Uh, what we know is that this president is the king of spin, right? He's told almost 17,000 lies in the last three years he's been president. 17,000 false or misleading claims. He says everything is great when we know it's not, right? He tries to spin his work on the economy when we know his trade war is impacting agriculture, now manufacturing. We know that the ultra-rich are getting way richer and the rest of us are suffering and so we expect to hear a lot of spin a lot of misrepresentation he's talking to his base and certainly a lot of rhetoric a lot of racist rhetoric his, his words around immigration let's not forget there are still children caged at the border mm. that that the muslim ban was expanded by by six more countries and so we need to make sure that and i, I can't wait to hear the uh, response from governor whitmer uh and of course uh, veronica escobar who's right at the border who's going to do it in spanish because uh, that's where the truth is going to come in is with that response. We expect we expect a lot of spin, a lot of misrepresentation, and, and everything to be perfect and great. That, that is <laughs> Donald Trump. And you're also right. The line that he will be saying, uh, we are told, is the United States of America should be a sanctuary for law-abiding Americans, not criminal aliens. And whatever you think of the policy implications of that, uh, since he stepped on the national scene talking about how Mexico sends rapists uh, to the United States, uh, he has drawn that issue in the the starkest and, as many believe, the, the most racist terms. He would deny that. But Yvette, thank you uh, very much for that. So we should say uh, one of the pieces of theater that presidents get to have in the State of the Union is filling the First Lady's box with guests that they might reference in their speech, and one of them uh, in, the lady, in the First Lady's box above the Senate chamber, Rush Limbaugh, and his wife will be up there, uh, Rush Limbaugh. Uh, one of the most influential political voices of the past generation, Byron, who announced yesterday that he has uh, advanced lung cancer. The president wants to honor him 
very divisive, but he changed American political discourse. Oh, without question, a force. And I think it was, you know, as, as, as we saw a, a different circumstance, but as, as we saw last week with Kobe Bryant, that it's, it's humbling when, when the reality that, that faces us all mm. um, impacts the lives of, 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 of people of note. Is it Rush Limbaugh, a, a force, a lion for, uh, for conservative positions? Uh, and, and he's a force in raising money, uh, for, for driving the agenda of the Republican Party. Um, and, and, and yesterday and, and the other day, and just, it's hearing his words and, and the, the, the haunting nature of his voice now. Uh, it, it, it does remind you for as div divisive, as uh, divided as the nation can be at times, as difficult as our politics are, that people have their individual lives. I, I, I thought when he spoke uh, uh, the other day about his family. Uh, and that regardless of how we feel about each other's politics, uh, you always wish well for an individual. And, and, I, and thinking about, you know, this, this night, and you, know, you and I both have been around the world, uh, and, and Martha touched upon this, that we've been a lot of places in the world that where these kinds of gatherings of powerful people do, only occur when someone has to die for it to happen. But in our nation, as divided as we may be, that politicians from both sides of the aisle, they're being polite to each other, they're shaking hands, they're being civil. Um, and that's one of the many things that makes America such a magical place. That for all that divides us, we are still the United States of America. And, and this event, the State of the Union Address, as you see the members of Congress and senators filing in there in advance of the president, uh, is something, the State of the Union is in the Constitution. One of the requirements of being a president, and there actually aren't many, it's a very vague, majestic generalities, as they say, uh, define the Constitution, but to say the president shall give uh, an address on the State of the Union, shall report on the State of the Union. It didn't have to be a speech. It was originally written down. Here's Nancy Pelosi trying to get a little Your order here. Will come to order. The chair appoints its members of the committee on the part of the House to escort the President of the United States into the chamber. The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Hoyer. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Clyburn. The gentleman from New Mexico, what, Mr. Nancy Lujan. The gentleman from Mr. Newark. What she's doing Newark, there is Mr. announcing Jeffrey. the escort. The uh, that's an honor for people to escort the president, the and those are the people who will Illinois, escort the president Mr. into the, the into the chamber. Let's go to our Pierre Thomas, who covers justice issues and other things as well. And Pierre, I, I want to pick up on one thing that we've been exploring, and that is the security of the vote. Uh, in our election. I know that you've done a lot of work on that. What impact do you see uh, the debacle in Iowa having? And what are the main concerns that law enforcement has going forward in this election about the security of the vote? Well, Terry, even though the election coming up in 2020 will be handled by the individual states, clearly what happened in Iowa uh, yesterday in terms of how the Democrats handled it does not inspire confidence, and um, uh, to say the least. And law enforcement continues to be concerned about uh, protecting uh, the election, the, the ballot box, if you will. Just yesterday, the uh, Department of Homeland Security uh, put out a notice to the states talking about the fact that the Russians will continue to likely uh, try to uh, attack uh, the election. They talked about how in 2016 the Russians actually were able to get inside the voter database uh, of the state of Illinois and that they could have altered or changed, it, changed um, some of the voter data. Uh, they also talked about the fact that the Russians had set up a fake website to, uh, to put out um, fake stories uh, posing as legitimate uh, journalism. So that is very much on the minds of law enforcement. And in fact, when I spoke with the FBI, director in December, he said that Russia was at it in the past and they'll be at it again. And, and as we were talking, the, the, the mere vulnerability of the count to hacking is enough to erode trust. And I want to ask you, I, I lived in uh, England for five years and covered a few elections there. They count 30, 35, 40 million ballots, paper ballots by hand. It takes a while. It's probably not as accurate as a perfect and reliable software count would be, but that's where we are right now. How much, how much esteem is there behind the movement for the United States to go back to paper ballots? 
Well, you know, I can't say that there's a lot. Um, the There is a lot of conversation about having backups to some of these computer systems. Uh, there's some legislation that's been pending in the, uh, the Congress that Democrats want uh, uh, the senator, the Senate Majority Leader, to act on that he is not, uh, leading to some to call him Moscow Mitch, which he doesn't like, like very much. Uh, so that is still, even that, Terry, in our country is an area of divide, even though we know what happened in 2016. Hmm. All right. Well, uh, we'll look at how that develops. Pierre, thanks very much. Let's, let's step back for a moment and take a, a look at this moment, this moment for Donald Trump and for the country, and, and let's get the take of someone who sat through some of those speeches, some of those State of the Union speeches. Barbara Comstock is a former member of Congress from the state of Virginia. Barbara, uh, what do you think of this moment for President Trump? What do you expect? Well, I think you always see in the State of the Union, the president gets the undivided attention and is able to set out his agenda and really highlight his successes. Hang so on. I think you're going to... Oh, yes, those are the members that did, so that's all right. Please go on. Well, and he always really has stuck to a script on the State of the Union, as most presidents do, because you want to include all of these successes. He has the economy that he can uh, has a lot of bragging rights on, 63% approval on that economy, the USMCA, a lot of opioid um, legislation where people have worked together on this. Yeah. And he, then he has things like criminal justice reform, and I think you're going to see a lot of the special guests that he has there today are going tonight are going to be addressing some of these bipartisan issues he has worked on. So that's why I think you've heard the White House talk about it being low key, but I think it will also um, be an attempt to sort of reset the narrative and take advantage of what is not only a lot of good news for the president, but a lot of bad news for the Democrats, given the debacle in Iowa, which obviously inures to the president's, uh, you know, uh, you know his his advantage. And then also tomorrow will be the end of impeachment, which, like Bill Clinton, it, impeachment has actually made him stronger and given him his highest approval ratings now. That's right. It is mirrors that impeachment a little bit. We're looking at the chamber right now. We see Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi on the dais wearing white, as do as are many of the. Uh, Democratic women uh, members of Congress. Uh, take us in that room a little bit. But the white is in honor of the suffragist uh, movement and, uh, and perhaps the ERA as well. Take us in the room a little bit. What's it like to, to, to be in their room? It, it's actually smaller than it looks on television, isn't it? Well, it does. It's an evening where it's very packed. Everyone is, is in there. And so a lot of times you have Democrats and Republicans sitting next to each other. You don't have to be on, you know, your own side. So you have people who are friends who will um, come together. And then there's always who's going to stand up, for, you know, and clap at certain points. And that's why I think, you know, the president will gear a speech to really kind of forcing both sides to stand up and clap. You know, if you talk about the success of the economy, if you talk about the work they've done together for our veterans or to battle opioids, you're going to have to have the whole audience rise. And I, I was there during the Obama administration as well as the Trump administration, and I know that is sort of the script that a good speechwriter will set out so that you find the ways to bring everyone together, and you usually w will see people do that, and those who don't kind of look like, you know, sore sports. <laughs> right. Well, bringing together is, is one of the things the presidents can do from, from the dais. But we also know from the excerpts that the White House has released that he's got some, some lines designed to dis divide and stoke the base. This one yeah. where he, I've said it a couple of times, the United States of America should be a sanctuary for law-abiding Americans, not criminal aliens. And he has everything capitalized. And so in the socialism lines, right. certainly that's going to be something that for the American public at home, is going to be well received. You may have people on the Democrat side not want to stand up to it, but actually some of those more socialist leaning members aren't even attending tonight in protest. Right, exactly. They have they have stayed back, as Mary Bruce said. Barbara, thanks very much. I want to pick up on, on the immigration issue and go to Devin Dwyer. Devin, you were just out in Iowa talking to people uh, up in northeastern Iowa, I believe, about the issue. Donald Trump ha has changed the way people talk about it, and you heard that. 
Yeah, I sure did, Terry. This is an issue that doesn't always divide evenly along party lines as well. Uh, Northeast Iowa relies on immigrants for their economy, like so many other parts of this country. Uh, and even though it voted for Donald Trump by 29 points uh, back in the election in 2016, they were very concerned about the president's language. They want the laws enforced, but they want legal immigrants, too. Uh, and it sort of was an I I indicator of where the conversation is at on this issue. So many people on both sides uh, are frustrated. They want some common sense, as we see the Supreme Court justices that we were talking about earlier, Ter Terry, uh, coming into the chamber right now. Right. Uh, and so I think you're going to see the president use this moment tonight to pivot, to pivot away from immigration, as Barbara was mentioning. You're going to see Democrats try to do the same thing. This is a big audience for both parties. 47 million people tuning in tonight, Terry. We'll hear a lot about health care and immigration two issues you're going to hear a lot about headed into this campaign this fall. All right. Thanks, Devin. I want to go to Byron for some final thoughts here on, on the person of Donald Trump, the personality. Politicians tend to be, they used to be, about addition. Big, inclusive statements, get as many voters as you can. But Donald Trump came to office with this deliberately divisive rhetoric. What do you expect from him? I expect more of the same. You know, talking before, I mean, there, there are things he can talk about uh, that he's done well with that would grow the tent larger, you know, his his work with criminal justice reform. And the Super Bowl ad. Yes, he yes. started his re-election yes. campaign with that ad. Just today, I interviewed 50 Cent, 50 Cent, for a story I'm working on. And he talked about huh. uh, criminal justice reform and, and, and gave a nod to the President of the United States. And so you would think he, he, there, is, there would be a way for him to lean into that to enlarge the tent. But as you said, that's not his style. Mm. Do you think he's doing that, that criminal justice reform and that ad where there was a black woman yes. that got out of prison? Is he looking to take black voters away from the Democratic Party, or is he sending a message uh, to other voters, to white voters? With them? I, I would tend to believe, just based on people who I talk to around the country, that it, it, is, it is the second, right? That it is an effort to show that, see, despite what people say about me, look at, look at what I've done. Um, but I, I think, in, in certainly in many minority communities, uh, on a host of issues, this president is not seen as someone who, who, who welcomes them into the tent. Not so far, anyway. Well, we are going to take a break. When we come back, you'll be on the network with George Stephanopoulos to see the president's State of the Union address. The Congress, the Diplomatic Corps, the Supreme Court all assembled. And the president of the United States will enter that chamber shortly uh, and probably take a bit of a victory lap on the economy and on impeachment as he stands before the Congress that did it. We'll be back. Friday night, the first debate after Iowa and the last debate before New Hampshire votes. Who will emerge? The critical ABC debate with ABC News Live anchor Lindsay Davis co-moderating alongside George Stephanopoulos and David Muir. Friday night, streaming everywhere on ABC News Live. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. It's a number one true crime podcast. There was a murder in central Ohio. The man who committed that crime once sat on death row, but now he's on the run. His name is Lester Eubanks. Now, listen as U.S. Marshals give stunning access in the manhunt to catch a fugitive. Those nine lives are running out, and we're going to catch up with Lester. Follow the clues. Can you help U.S. Marshals catch this killer? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen free now on Apple Podcasts. 
ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. And download the app now and sign up to get important breaking news alerts wherever you are. ABC News, honored, winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor, overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. This is what being live is all about. I can see me pushing through. This is ABC News Live. Neighborhoods are underwater. 24 7 streaming news source, ABC News. <laughs> Imagine breaking news, live events as they happen, streaming live, non stop, straight to you. Imagine instant, incredible access to the most compelling live video. That's grenade. Original, on the edge, breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN, all the most innovative storytellers, all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want, free. And imagine the most celebrated, epic live events and moments this is live? all playing out right before your eyes. See those flames behind me? Go We're there now. To put this fire out right now. ABC News Live. Think of it as your live stream adrenaline rush. Just look at all of the smoke here. Real, raw, Welcome live. To the Columbus Zoo. No matter where the next step takes us, we're taking it. It's frightening. And go deeper inside the groundbreaking exclusives from the campaign trail only ABC News gets. Behind the scenes, exclusive access. Take you inside for an extraordinary tour here at ABC News Live. This is it. It's time to go there, Line, be there, cloud. experience it live on the scene. Maybe We're that's here. why, in just one year, ABC News Live is already America's number one live streaming news. And imagine this, it's free. Watch ABC News Live right now and anytime, streaming on Roku, Hulu, Facebook, and abcnews.com. ABC News Live, streaming everywhere right to you. Live from ABC News, the State of the Union, and the Democratic response. Now reporting, George Stephanopoulos. Good evening and welcome to our special coverage of the State of the Union. These annual speeches, always a moment of high political theater, this year takes it to a brand new level. The president about to enter a House chamber where just seven weeks ago he was impeached. That has happened before Bill Clinton in 1999, but Trump is now the first president in American history to face re-election after impeachment. This addressed the kickoff of his 2020 campaign. He enters the chamber one day before senators would deliver the verdict in his impeachment trial. Acquittal is certain. And one day after the chaos and confusion of Iowa's Democratic caucus. As we come on the air tonight, still no official winner, but the results we have show Pete Buttigieg, Bernie Sanders, and Elizabeth Warren all ahead of Joe Biden, who for much of the last year had been polling best against President Trump. And tonight, the president's audience in the chamber even more split than we've come to expect. Democrats, like Nancy Pelosi, you see her right there, convinced Trump is a lawless president who betrayed his oath by inviting foreign interference in our elections. Congressional Republicans united behind him, at least publicly, many echoing the president's claim that he did nothing wrong in his dealings with Ukraine. And all this against the backdrop of an economy growing for its 11th straight year, the longest expansion in American history. That, plus overwhelming support from his GOP base, has driven Trump's approval to the highest levels of his presidency. So expect a buoyant speech tonight. World News anchor David Muir is in Washington. David, we joined a group for lunch with the president earlier today. He clearly believes he's in the driver's seat as we start this election year. Yeah, really no question about that, George. Fully aware of those poll numbers, uh, the Gallup number in particular nearing 50%. That's an all-time high uh, for this presidency. We know the numbers drive uh, this president aware at all times where the polls are. Also aware of the strong economy. He'll talk about that quite a bit tonight. Uh, the Dow hitting 29,000 for the first time in recent weeks. And as you pointed out, George, 
change. Uh, it's not the elephant in the room. Everyone in Washington aware that the president uh, is on the eve of acquittal in the Senate impeachment trial. He has survived the impeachment hearings and the trial. All eyes on the president, but also all eyes tonight on House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. And I have to tell you, George, after we met with the president, which is a tradition to meet with presidents on, on the days of these addresses, that goes back several administrations. But we also met with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who confirmed this afternoon that she has not spoken with President Trump since October 16th. It's been months since those two have had a private conversation. And here comes the Sergeant at Arms, Paul Irving, to announce the president. our senior congressional correspondent. If the president is buoyant, Democrats defiant. George, we are now seeing the president coming face to face for the first time with his accusers in this impeachment process. The, the body language alone here tonight is going to be fascinating. There is a lot of tension in that room. While it is not clear whether the president is going to bring up impeachment, it is clear that this is going to be a very awkward moment for many inside that chamber. You mentioned House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. She, of course, will be over her shoulder throughout this entire speech, having led her party in impeaching the president. She now is effectively having to welcome him into her house. And the president, we know directly in his eyesight tonight, will be those House managers who have been leading the case against the president in the Senate. Now, Republicans that I have talked to here are urging the president to steer clear of the sub subject of impeachment entirely, while Democrats are bracing for the president to take something of a victory lap. And in fact, George, uh, uh, roughly a dozen Democrats are simply sitting it out, saying they don't want to dignify the president's actions with their presence here tonight. The president there shaking the hand of Chief Justice John Roberts, who of course has been presiding over the Senate trial. I'd love to have heard what they were saying right there. John Carl is in the chamber as well, John. And John, in part because of impeachment, this is State of the Union a little later than most years, which means it came right after that Iowa caucus yesterday. The president reveling in that confusion. He called it, George, an unmitigated disaster this morning, but he is positively giddy about the chaos and the uncertainty among the Democrats while he has strengthened his grip on the Republican Party going into the campaign. And make no mistake, this, above all, will be a campaign speech tonight. President walking up to the podium, let's see that encounter with the House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi. He will hand both the Speaker and the Vice President a copy of his speech. An extended hand from the speaker. I'm not sure if the president saw it or not, but regardless, they didn't shake hands. The president will take this in for a few minutes to the first lady right there. She's joining her box tonight by Rush Limbaugh, the talk radio host. You see him right there, who of course announced yesterday uh, that he's fighting lung cancer. Members of Congress, the President of the United States. There you see the whole chamber. Expect many times tonight for one side to be cheering, the other to be sitting. And notice all that white in the room. Many members of Congress wearing white in honor of the suffragette movement. You need any more proof? It's a political speech. The chance of four more years from House and Senate Republicans. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, Mr. Vice President, members of Congress, the First Lady of the United States. <laughs> A 
my fellow citizens, three years ago, we launched the great American comeback. Tonight, I stand before you to share the incredible results. Jobs are booming, incomes are soaring, poverty is plummeting, crime is falling, confidence is surging, and our country is thriving and highly respected again. America's enemies are on the run. America's fortunes are on the rise, and America's future is blazing bright. The years of economic decay are over. The days of our country being used, taken advantage of, and even scorned by other nations are long behind us. Gone to are the broken promises, jobless recoveries, tired platitudes, and constant excuses for the depletion of American wealth, power, and prestige. In just three short years, we have shattered the mentality of American decline, and we have rejected the downsizing of Americans' destiny. We have totally rejected the downsizing. We are moving forward at a pace that was unimaginable just a short time ago, and we are never, ever going back. to report to you tonight that our economy is the best it has ever been. Our military is completely rebuilt, with its power being unmatched anywhere in the world, and it's not even close. Our borders are secure. Our families are flourishing. Our values are renewed. Our pride is restored. And for all of these reasons, I say to the people of our great country, and to the members of Congress, the state of our union is stronger than ever before. The vision I will lay out this evening demonstrates how we are building the world's most prosperous and inclusive society, one where every citizen can join in America's unparalleled success, and where every community can take part in America's extraordinary rise. From the instant I took office, I moved rapidly to revive the U.S. economy, slashing a record number of job-killing regulations, enacting historic and record-setting tax cuts, and fighting for fair and reciprocal trade agreements. Our agenda is relentlessly pro-worker, pro-family, pro-growth, and most of all, pro-American. advancing with unbridled optimism and lifting our citizens of every race, color, religion, and creed very, very high. Since my election, we have created 7 million new jobs, 5 million more than government experts projected during the previous administration.
The unemployment rate is the lowest in over half a century. And very incredibly, the average unemployment rate under my administration is lower than any administration in the history of our country. Yeah. If we hadn't reversed the failed economic policies of the previous administration, the world would not now be witnessing this great economic success. The unemployment rate for African Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Asian Americans has reached the lowest levels in history. African American youth unemployment has reached an all time low. African-American poverty has declined to the lowest rate ever recorded. The unemployment rate for women reached the lowest level in almost 70 years, and last year women filled 72 percent of all new jobs added. The veterans' unemployment rate dropped to a record low. The unemployment rate for disabled Americans has reached an all-time low. Workers without a high school diploma have achieved the lowest unemployment rate recorded in U.S. history. A record number of young Americans are now employed. Under the last administration, more than 10 million people were added to the food stamp rolls. Under my administration, 7 million Americans have come off food stamps, and 10 million people have been lifted off of welfare. In eight years under the last administration, over 300,000 working-age people dropped out of the workforce. In just three years of my administration, 3.5 million people, working-age people, have joined the workforce. Since my election, the net worth of the bottom half of wage earners has increased by 47 percent, three times faster than the increase for the top 1 percent. After decades of flat and falling incomes, wages are rising fast, and wonderfully, they are rising fastest for low-income workers who have seen a 16 percent pay increase since my election.
This is a blue collar boom. Household income is now at the highest level ever recorded. Since my election, U.S. stock markets have soared 70 percent, adding more than $12 trillion to our nation's wealth, transcending anything anyone believed was possible. This is a record. It is something that every country in the world is looking up to. They admire. Consumer confidence has just reached amazing new highs. All of those millions of people with 401ks and pensions are doing far better than they have ever done before with increases of 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100 percent and even more. Jobs and investments are pouring into 9,000 previously neglected neighborhoods thanks to Opportunity Zones, a plan spearheaded by Senator Tim Scott as part of our great Republican tax cuts. In other words, wealthy people and companies are pouring money into poor neighborhoods or areas that haven't seen investment in many decades, creating jobs, energy, and excitement. This is the first time that these deserving communities have seen anything like this. It's all working. Opportunity Zones are helping Americans like Army veteran Tony Rankins from Cincinnati, Ohio. After struggling with drug addiction, Tony lost his job, his house, and his family. He was homeless. But then Tony found a construction company that invests in Opportunity Zones. He is now a top tradesman, drug-free, reunited with his family, and he is here tonight Tony, keep up the great work, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Our roaring economy has, for the first time ever, given many former prisoners the ability to get a great job and a fresh start. This second chance at life is made possible because we passed landmark criminal justice reform into law. Everybody said that criminal justice reform couldn't be done, but I got it done, and the people in this room got it done. Thanks to our bold regulatory reduction campaign, the United States has become the number one producer of oil and natural gas anywhere in the world, by far. With the tremendous progress we have made over the past three years, America is now energy independent, and energy jobs, like so many other elements of our country, are at a record high. We are doing numbers that no one would have thought possible just three years ago. Likewise, we are restoring our nation's manufacturing might, even though predictions were, as you all know, that this could never, ever be done. 
after losing 60,000 factories under the previous two administrations. America has now gained 12,000 new factories under my administration, with thousands upon thousands of plants and factories being planned or being built. Companies are not leaving. They are coming back to the USA. The fact is that everybody wants to be where the action is, and the United States of America is indeed the place where the action is. One of the biggest promises I made to the American people was to replace the disastrous NAFTA trade deal. In fact, unfair trade is perhaps the single biggest reason that I decided to run for president. Following NAFTA's adoption, our nation lost one in four manufacturing jobs. Many politicians came and went pledging to change or replace NAFTA, only to do so, and then absolutely nothing happened. But unlike so many who came before me, I keep my promises. We did our job. <laughs> Six days ago, I replaced NAFTA and signed the brand-new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement into law. The USMCA will create nearly 100,000 new high-paying American auto jobs and massively boost exports for our farmers, ranchers, and factory workers. It will also bring trade with Mexico and Canada to a much higher level, but also to be a much greater degree of fairness and reciprocity. We will have that fairness and reciprocity. And I say that finally, because it's been many, many years that we were treated fairly on trade. This is the first major trade deal in many years to earn the strong backing of America's labor unions. I also promised our citizens that I would impose tariffs to confront China's massive theft of America's jobs. Our strategy has worked. Days ago, we signed the groundbreaking new agreement with China that will defend our workers, protect our intellectual property, bring billions and billions of dollars into our Treasury, and open vast new markets for products made and grown right here in the USA. For decades, China has taken advantage of the United States. Now we have changed that. But at the same time, we have perhaps the best relationship we've ever had with China, including with President Xi. They respect what we've done because, quite frankly, they could never really believe that they were able to get away with what they were doing year after year, decade after decade, without someone in our country stepping up and saying, that's enough. <laughs> now we want to rebuild our country, and that's exactly what we're doing. We are rebuilding our country. As we restore American leadership throughout the world, we are once again standing up for freedom in our hemisphere. That's why my administration reversed the failing policies of the previous administration on Cuba. We are supporting the hopes of Cubans, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans to restore democracy. The United States is leading 
a 59-nation diplomatic coalition against the socialist dictator of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro. his people, but Maduro's grip on tyranny will be smashed and broken. Here this evening is a very brave man who carries with him the hopes, dreams, and aspirations of all Venezuelans. Joining us in the gallery is the true and legitimate president of Venezuela, Juan Guaido. <laughs> Mr. President, please take this message back to your Thank you, Mr. President. Great honor. Thank you very much. Please take this message back that all Americans are united with the Venezuelan people in their righteous struggle for freedom. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Socialism destroys nations, but always remember freedom unifies the soul. <laughs> to safeguard American liberty, we have invested a record-breaking $2.2 trillion in the United States military. purchased the finest planes, missiles, rockets, ships, and every other form of military equipment, and it's all made right here in the USA. We are also getting our allies, finally, to help pay their fair share. contributions from other NATO members by more than $400 billion, and the number of allies meeting their minimum obligations has more than doubled. And just weeks ago, for the first time since President Truman established the Air Force, more than 70 years earlier, we created a brand new branch of the United States Armed Forces. It's called the Space Force. Very important. In the gallery tonight, we have a young gentleman and what he wants so badly, 13 years old, Ian Lonfay. He's an eighth grader from Arizona. Ian, please stand up. Ian has always dreamed of going to space. He was the first in his class and among the youngest at an aviation academy. He aspires to go to the Air Force Academy, and then he has his eye on the Space Force. As Ian says, most people look up at space. I want to look down on the world. <laughs> But 
But sitting behind Ian tonight is his greatest hero of them all, Charles McGee was born in Cleveland, Ohio, one century ago. Charles is one of the last surviving Tuskegee Airmen, the first black fighter pilots, and he also happens to be Ian's great-grandfather. Incredible story. After more than 130 combat missions in World War II, he came back home to a country still struggling for civil rights and went on to serve America in Korea and Vietnam. On December 7th, Charles celebrated his 100th birthday. A few weeks ago, I signed a bill promoting Charles McGee to Brigadier General. And earlier today, I pinned the stars on his shoulders in the Oval Office. General McGee, our nation salutes you. Thank you, sir. From the pilgrims to the founders, from the soldiers at Valley Forge to the marchers at Selma, and from President Lincoln to the Reverend Martin Luther King, Americans have always rejected limits on our children's future. Members of Congress, we must never forget that the only victories that matter in Washington are victories that deliver for the American people. The people are the heart of our country. Their dreams are the soul of our country. And their love is what powers and sustains our country. We must always remember that our job is to put America first. The next step forward in building an inclusive society is making sure that every young American gets a great education and the opportunity to achieve the American dream. Yet for too long, countless American children have been trapped in failing government schools. To rescue these students, 18 states have created school choice in the form of opportunity scholarships. The programs are so popular that tens of thousands of students remain on a waiting list. One of those students is Janiah Davis, a fourth grader from Philadelphia, Janiah. Janiah's mom, Stephanie, is a single parent. She would do anything to give her daughter a better future. But last year, that future was put further out of reach when Pennsylvania's governor vetoed legislation to expand school choice to 50,000 children. 
Janiah and Stephanie are in the gallery. Stephanie, thank you so much for being here with your beautiful daughter. Thank you very much. But, Janiah, I have some good news for you, because I am pleased to inform you that your long wait is over. I can proudly announce tonight that an Opportunity Scholarship has become available. It's going to you, and you will soon be heading to the school of your choice. Now I call on Congress to give one million American children the same opportunity Janiah has just received. Pass the Education Freedom Scholarships and Opportunities Act, because no parent should be forced to send their child to a failing government school. Every young person should have a safe and secure environment in which to learn and to grow. For this reason, our magnificent First Lady has launched the Be Best initiative to advance a safe, healthy, supportive, and drug-free life for the next generation, online, in school, and in our communities. Thank you, Melania, for your extraordinary love and profound care for America's children. Thank you very much. My administration is determined to give our citizens the opportunities they need, regardless of age or background. Through our pledge to American workers, over 400 companies will also provide new jobs and education opportunities to almost 15 million Americans. My budget also contains an exciting vision for our nation's high schools. Tonight, I ask Congress to support our students and back my plan to offer vocational and technical education in every single high school in America. To expand equal opportunity, I am also proud that we achieved record and permanent funding for our nation's historically black colleges and universities. A good life for American families also requires the most affordable, innovative, and high-quality health care system on Earth. Before I took office, health insurance premiums had more than doubled in just five years. I moved quickly to provide affordable alternatives. Our new plans are up to 60 percent less expensive and better. I've also made an ironclad pledge to American families. We will always protect patients with pre-existing conditions. And we will always protect your Medicare, and we will always protect your Social Security, always.
The American patient should never be blindsided by medical bills. That is why I signed an executive order requiring price transparency. Many experts believe that transparency, which will go into full effect at the beginning of next year, will be even bigger than health care reform. It will save families massive amounts of money for substantially better care. But as we work to improve Americans' health care, there are those who want to take away your health care, take away your doctor, and abolish private insurance entirely. 132 lawmakers in this room have endorsed legislation to impose a socialist takeover of our health care system, wiping out the private health insurance plans of 180 million very happy Americans. To those watching at home tonight, I want you to know we will never let socialism destroy American health care. Over 130 legislators in this chamber have endorsed legislation that would bankrupt our nation by providing free taxpayer-funded health care to millions of illegal aliens, forcing taxpayers to subsidize free care for anyone in the world who unlawfully crosses our borders. These proposals would raid the Medicare benefits of our seniors and that our seniors depend on while acting as a powerful lure for illegal immigration. That is what is happening in California and other states. Their systems are totally out of control, costing taxpayers vast and unaffordable amounts of money. If forcing American taxpayers to provide unlimited free health care to illegal aliens sounds fair to you, then stand with the radical left. But if you believe that we should defend American patients and American seniors, then stand with me and pass legislation to prohibit free government health care for illegal aliens. This will be a tremendous boon to our already very strongly guarded southern border, where, as we speak, a long, tall, and very powerful wall is being built. We have now completed over 100 miles and have over 500 miles fully completed in a very short period of time. Early next year, we will have substantially more than 500 miles completed. My administration is also taking on the big pharmaceutical companies. We have approved a record number of affordable generic drugs and medicines are being approved by the FDA at a faster clip than ever before. I was pleased to announce last year that for the first time in 51 years, the cost of prescription drugs actually went down. <laughs> and working together, Congress can reduce drug prices substantially from current levels. I've been speaking to Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa and others in Congress in order to get something on drug pricing done and done quickly and properly. I'm calling for bipartisan legislation that achieves the goal of dramatically lowering prescription drug prices. Get a bill on my desk and I will sign it into law immediately.
with unyielding commitment. We are curbing the opioid epidemic. Drug overdose deaths declined for the first time in nearly 30 years. Among the state's hardest hit, Ohio is down 22 percent, Pennsylvania is down 18 percent, Wisconsin is down 10 percent, and we will not quit until we have beaten the opioid epidemic once and for all. Protecting Americans' health also means fighting infectious diseases. We are coordinating with the Chinese government and working closely together on the coronavirus outbreak in China. My administration will take all necessary steps to safeguard our citizens from this threat. We have launched ambitious new initiatives to substantially improve care for Americans with kidney disease, Alzheimer's, and those struggling with mental health. And because Congress was so good as to fund my request, new cures for childhood cancer, and we will eradicate the AIDS epidemic in America by the end of this decade. family knows the pain when a loved one is diagnosed with a serious illness. Here tonight is a special man, beloved by millions of Americans, who just received a stage 4 advanced cancer diagnosis. This is not good news, but what is good news is that he is the greatest fighter and winner that you will ever meet. Rush Limbaugh, thank you for your decades of tireless devotion to our country. And Rush, in recognition of all that you have done for our nation, the millions of people a day that you speak to and that you inspire, and all of the incredible work that you have done for charity, I am proud to announce tonight that you will be receiving our country's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. the First Lady of the United States to present you with the honor, please.
And Catherine, congratulations. Thank you, Catherine. As we pray for all who are sick, we know that America is constantly achieving new medical breakthroughs. In 2017, doctors at St. Luke's Hospital in Kansas City delivered one of the earliest premature babies ever to survive. Born at just 21 weeks and six days and weighing less than a pound, Ellie Schneider was a born fighter. Through the skill of her doctors and the prayers of her parents, little Ellie kept on winning the battle of life. Today, Ellie is a strong, healthy two-year-old girl sitting with her amazing mother, Robin. In the gallery, Ellie and Robin, we are glad to have you with us tonight. that every child is a miracle of life. And thanks to modern medical wonders, 50% of very premature babies delivered at the hospital where Ellie was born now survive. It's an incredible thing. Thank you very much. Our goal should be to ensure that every baby has the best chance to thrive and grow just like Ellie. That is why I'm asking Congress to provide an additional $50 million to fund neonatal research for America's youngest patients. That is why I'm also calling upon members of Congress here tonight to pass legislation finally banning the late-term abortion of babies. Republican, Democrat, or Independent, surely we must all agree that every human life is a sacred gift from God. As we support America's moms and dads, I was recently proud to sign the law providing new parents in the federal workforce paid family leave, serving as a model for the rest of the country. Congress to pass the Bipartisan Advancing Support for Working Families Act, extending family leave to mothers and fathers all across our nation. Forty million American families have an average $2,200 extra thanks to our child tax credit. Also overseen historic funding increases for high quality child care, enabling 17 states to help more children, many of which have reduced or eliminated their wait lists altogether. And I sent Congress a plan with a vision to further expand access to high quality child care and urge you to act immediately. To protect the environment, days ago, I announced that the United States will join the One Trillion Trees Initiative, an ambitious effort to bring together government and private sector to plant new trees in America and all around the world.
We must also rebuild America's infrastructure. Senator John Barrasso's highway bill to invest in new roads, bridges, and tunnels all across our land. I'm also committed to ensuring that every citizen can have access to high-speed internet, including and especially in rural America. for all Americans also requires us to keep America safe. That means supporting the men and women of law enforcement at every level, including our nation's heroic ICE officers. year, our brave ICE officers arrested more than 120,000 criminal aliens charged with nearly 10,000 burglaries, 5,000 sexual assaults, 45,000 violent assaults, and 2,000 murders. Tragically, there are many cities in America where radical politicians have chosen to provide sanctuary for these criminal illegal aliens. In sanctuary cities, local officials order police to release dangerous criminal aliens to prey upon the public instead of handing them over to ICE to be safely removed. Just 29 days ago, a criminal alien freed by the sanctuary city of New York was charged with the brutal rape and murder of a 92-year-old woman. The killer had been previously arrested for assault, but under New York sanctuary policies, he was set free. If the city had honored ICE's detainer request, his victim would still be alive today. The state of California passed an outrageous law declaring their whole state to be a sanctuary for criminal illegal immigrants, a very terrible sanctuary with catastrophic results. Here is just one tragic example. In December 2018, California police detained an illegal alien with five prior arrests, including convictions for robbery and assault. But as required by California's sanctuary law, local authorities released him. Days later, the criminal alien went on a gruesome spree of deadly violence. He viciously shot one man going about his daily work. He approached a woman sitting in her car and shot her in the arm and in the chest. He walked into a convenience store and wildly fired his weapon. He hijacked a truck and smashed into vehicles, critically injuring innocent victims. One of the victims is a terrible, terrible situation. Died, 51-year-old American named Rocky Jones. Rocky was at a gas station when this vile criminal fired eight bullets at him from close range, murdering him in cold blood. Rocky left behind a devoted family, including his brothers, who loved him more than anything else in the world. One of his grieving brothers is here with us tonight. Jody, would you please stand? Jody, thank you. weep for your loss, and we will not rest until you have justice. Senator Tom Tillis has introduced legislation to allow Americans like Jody to sue sanctuary cities and states when a loved one is hurt or killed as a result of these deadly practices. Congress to pass the Justice for Victims of Sanctuary Cities Act immediately.
The United States of America should be a sanctuary for law-abiding Americans, not criminal aliens. In the last three years, ICE has arrested over 5,000 wicked human traffickers, and I have signed nine pieces of legislation to stamp out the menace of human trafficking domestically and all around the globe. My administration has undertaken an unprecedented effort to secure the southern border of the United States. Before I came into office, if you showed up illegally on our southern border and were arrested, you were simply released and allowed into our country, never to be seen again. My administration has ended catch and release. If you come illegally, you will now be promptly removed from our country. Very importantly, we entered into historic cooperation agreements with the governments of Mexico, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. As a result of our unprecedented efforts, illegal crossings are down 75 percent since May, dropping eight straight months in a row. And as the wall rapidly goes up, drug seizures rise, and the border crossings are going down and going down very rapidly. Last year, I traveled to the border in Texas and met Chief Patrol Agent Raul Ortiz. Over the last 24 months, Agent Ortiz and his team have seized more than 200,000 pounds of poisonous narcotics, arrested more than 3,000 human smugglers, and rescued more than 2,000 migrants. Days ago, Agent Ortiz was promoted to Deputy Chief of Border Patrol, and he joins us tonight. Chief Ortiz, please stand. Hey. A grateful nation thanks you and all of the heroes of Border Patrol and ICE. Thank you very much. Thank you. To build on these historic gains, we are working on legislation to replace our outdated and randomized immigration system with one based on merit, welcoming those who follow the rules, contribute to our economy, support themselves financially, and uphold our values. With every action, my administration is restoring the rule of law and reasserting the culture of American freedom. <laughs> Working with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Thank you, Mitch. <laughs> and his colleagues in the Senate. We have confirmed a record number of 187 new federal judges to uphold our Constitution as written. This includes two brilliant new Supreme Court justices, Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh. Thank you. And we have many in the pipeline. <laughs> My administration is also defending religious liberty, and that includes the constitutional right to pray in public schools. <laughs> 
In America, we don't punish prayer. We don't tear down crosses. We don't ban symbols of faith. We don't muzzle preachers and pastors. In America, we celebrate faith. We cherish religion. We lift our voices in prayer, and we raise our sights to the glory of God. Just as we believe in the First Amendment, we also believe in another constitutional right that is under siege all across our country. So long as I am president, I will always protect your Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. In reaffirming our heritage as a free nation, we must remember that America has always been a frontier nation. Now we must embrace the next frontier, America's manifest destiny in the stars. I am asking Congress to fully fund the Artemis program to ensure that the next man and the first woman on the moon will be American astronauts, using this as a launching pad to ensure that America is the first nation to plan its flag on Mars. My administration is also strongly defending our national security and combating radical Islamic terrorism. Last week, I announced a groundbreaking plan for peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Recognizing that all past attempts have failed, we must be determined and creative in order to stabilize the region and give millions of young people the chance to realize a better future. Three years ago, the barbarians of ISIS held over 20,000 square miles of territory in Iraq and Syria. Today, the ISIS territorial caliphate has been 100 percent destroyed, and the founder and leader of ISIS, the bloodthirsty killer known as al-Baghdadi, is dead. We are joined this evening by Carl and Marcia Mueller. After graduating from college, their beautiful daughter, Carla, became a humanitarian aid worker. She once wrote, some people find God in church, some people find God in nature, some people find God in love. I find God in suffering. I've known for some time what my life's work is using my hands as tools to relieve suffering. In 2013, while caring for suffering civilians in Syria, Kayla was kidnapped, tortured, and enslaved by ISIS and kept as a prisoner of al-Baghdadi himself. After more than 500 horrifying days of captivity, al-Baghdadi murdered young, beautiful Kayla. She was just 26 years old. On the night that U.S. Special Forces operations ended al-Baghdadi's miserable life, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, received a call in the Situation Room. He was told that the brave men of the elite Special Forces team that so perfectly carried out the operation had given their mission a name, Task Force 814. It was a reference to a special day, August 14th, Kayla's birthday. Carl and Marcia, America's warriors, never forgot Kayla, and neither will we. Thank you.
Every day, America's men and women in uniform demonstrate the infinite depth of love that dwells in the human heart. One of these American heroes was Army Staff Sergeant Christopher Hake. On his second deployment to Iraq in 2008, Sergeant Hake wrote a letter to his one-year-old son, Gage. I will be with you again, he wrote to Gage. I will teach you to ride your first bike, build your first sandbox, watch you play sports, and see you have kids also. I love you, son. Take care of your mother. I am always with you, Daddy. On Easter Sunday of 2008, Chris was out on patrol in Baghdad when his Bradley fighting vehicle was hit by a roadside bomb. That night, he made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. Sergeant Hake now rests in eternal glory in Arlington, and his wife, Kelly, is in the gallery tonight, joined by their son, who is now a 13-year-old and doing very, very well. To Kelly and Gage, Chris will live in our hearts forever. He is looking down on you now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much. The terrorist responsible for killing Sergeant Hake was Kasim Soleimani, who provided the deadly roadside bomb that took Chris's life. Soleimani was the Iranian regime's most ruthless butcher, a monster who murdered or wounded thousands of American service members in Iraq. As the world's top terrorist, Soleimani orchestrated the deaths of countless men, women, and children. He directed the December assault and went on to assault. U.S. forces in Iraq was actively planning new attacks when we hit him very hard. And that's why last month, at my direction, the U.S. military executed a flawless precision strike that killed Soleimani and terminated his evil reign of terror forever. to the terrorists is clear. You will never escape American justice. If you attack our citizens, you forfeit your life. In recent months, we have seen proud Iranians raise their voices against their oppressive rulers. The Iranian regime must abandon its pursuit of nuclear weapons, stop spreading terror, death, and destruction, and start working for the good of its own people. Because of our powerful sanctions, the Iranian economy is doing very, very poorly. We can help them make a very good and short-time recovery. It can all go very quickly, but perhaps they are too proud or too foolish to ask for that help. We are here. Let's see which road they choose. It is totally up to them. As we defend American lives, we are working to end America's wars in the Middle East. In Afghanistan, the determination and valor of our warfighters has allowed us to make tremendous progress, and peace talks are now underway. I am not looking to kill hundreds of thousands of people in Afghanistan, many of them totally innocent. It is also not our function to serve other nations as law enforcement agencies. These are warfighters that we have, the best in the world, and they either want to fight to win or not fight at all. We are working to finally end America's longest war and bring our troops back home.
places a heavy burden on our nation's extraordinary military families, especially spouses like Amy Williams from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and her two children, six-year-old Eliana and three-year-old Rowan. Amy works full-time and volunteers countless hours helping other military families. For the past seven months, she has done it all while her husband, Sergeant First Class Townsend Williams, is in Afghanistan on his fourth deployment in the Middle East. Amy's kids haven't seen their father's face in many months. Amy, your family's sacrifice makes it possible for all of our families to live in safety and in peace, and we want to thank you. Thank you, Amy. Tonight, we have a very special surprise. I am thrilled to inform you that your husband is back from deployment. He is here with us tonight, and we couldn't keep him waiting any longer. Welcome home, Sergeant Williams. Thank you very much. As the world bears witness tonight, America is a land of heroes. This is a place where greatness is born, where destinies are forged, and where legends come to life. This is the home of Thomas Edison and Teddy Roosevelt, of many great generals, including Washington, Pershing, Patton, and MacArthur. This is the home of Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, Amelia Earhart, Harriet Tubman, the Wright brothers, Neil Armstrong, and so many more. This is the country where children learn names like Wyatt Earp, Davy Crockett, and Annie Oakley. This is the place where the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth and where Texas Patriots made their last stand at the Alamo. The beautiful, beautiful Alamo. The American nation was carved out of the vast frontier by the toughest, strongest, fiercest, and most determined men and women ever to walk on the face of the earth. Our ancestors braved the unknown, tamed the wilderness, settled the Wild West, lifted millions from poverty, disease, and hunger, vanquished tyranny and fascism, ushered the world to new heights of science and medicine, laid down the railroads, dug out the canals, raised up the skyscrapers, and ladies and gentlemen, our ancestors built the most exceptional republic ever to exist in all of human history, and we are making it greater than ever before.
This is our glorious and magnificent inheritance. We are Americans. We are pioneers. We are the pathfinders. We settled the new world. We built the modern world. And we change history forever by embracing the eternal truth that everyone is made equal by the hand of Almighty God. America is the place where anything can happen. America is the place where anyone can rise. And here, on this land, on this soil, on this continent, the most incredible dreams come true. This nation is our canvas, and this country is our masterpiece. We look at tomorrow and see unlimited frontiers just waiting to be explored. Our brightest discoveries are not yet known. Our most thrilling stories are not yet told. Our grandest journeys are not yet made. The American age, the American epic, the American adventure has only just begun. Our spirit is still young. The sun is still rising. God's grace is still shining. And my fellow Americans, the best is yet to come. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless America. Thank you very much. President Trump's election year, State of the Union, ends on an optimistic note. Absorbing the applause right there. He came out of reality television and he displayed that talent tonight. 78 minute extravaganza that touched emotions both high and low over those seven, 78 minutes. Superman. Began with a double snub. <laughs> President Trump refused the hand of Speaker Pelosi. She refused to say it was her high honor and distinct privilege, as speakers usually do, to introduce the President of the United States. Then a ringing declaration from the president. The State of the Union is stronger than ever before. And a litany of economic good news that you can't deny a president who has the good fortune to be in charge when that economic good news is being shared by so many Americans. Reached out to the African American community in an emotional way. And you're hearing you get the praise there from Republican members of Congress. Introducing one of the Tuskegee Airmen and his great grandson, who wants to be an astronaut. There were also gut punches at Democrats on health care and illegal immigration. Something we've never seen before a Congressional Medal of Honor given out during the State of the Union for Rush Limbaugh, the talk radio host. That's certain to be a controversial move. And something else we've seen on reality TV, on morning television, I know it well, a family reunion, an American serviceman coming home to greet his family. As I said, so many emotions touched. John Carl, you were in the chamber. George, uh, this is the 11th time I've been in the chamber for a State of the Union address. Uh, three different presidents. I have never seen anything like this. There were the high moments, certainly with Charles uh, McGee, the Tuskegee Airman, uh, that unified the chamber, but this was the most partisan and divided chamber I have ever seen for a State of the Union, even exceeding Trump a year ago. Uh, I don't know if you noticed this, but just after the president finished his speech, Nancy Pelosi somewhat dramatically tore the speech up behind him. Uh, as he came into this chamber, uh, none of the Democratic side applauded. That's a standard thing. Everybody applauds when the president comes in. That did not happen here. And when the speech was over, the Democrats ran for the exits. Uh, I, you know, usually you see the president's the first to, to leave the chamber. Uh, the Democratic side was almost completely empty by the time he worked his way uh, to, to where he is now. And George, also the other moment that stands out, chance of four more years. Uh, the Republican side is the Democrats uh, often booed and groaned during the speech. Uh, we had that moment towards the beginning where the president actually uh, was greeted with a chance 
stand to four more years from the Republican side. Again, something I've just, I've never seen in the State of the Union's address. The president, the president has left the chamber. Democratic response in just a couple of minutes. We'll be right back. The House come to order. State of the Union and the Democratic response. Here again, George Stephanopoulos. And we are back after President Trump's 2020 State of the Union, as we said, 78 minutes, where the president laid out his agenda for re-election. Also, uh, hit some chords of emotion and did something, as we said, that has never been done before, giving the Presidential Medal of Freedom during the State of the Union address. Senior White House correspondent Cecilia Vega is here with us. That is getting a lot of attention online. Yeah, because it appears that this was a completely unprecedented move that just happened, and they're awarding that Presidential Medal of Freedom not just in the chamber, but to someone as controversial and divisive in this country as Rush Limbaugh, who, whose past comments on race, whose past comments on women are already making the rounds on Twitter. Uh, people are many offended by this, but you heard those applause inside that chamber, George. The Republicans in there see Rush as a very strong person in their party, and they were happy to see this happen. He has been a strong supporter of President Trump as well. We are waiting now for the Democratic response. We given by the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of Michigan, should be speaking from the high school school cafeteria in East Lansing, Michigan, her two daughters attend the school. Good evening. I'm honored to be here and grateful that you're tuning in. I'm Gretchen Whitmer, the 49th governor of the great state of Michigan. Tonight, I'm at my daughter Sherry and Sydney's public school, East Lansing High School. We're here today with families and parents, teachers, and most importantly, students. I want to thank you all for coming, but tonight I'm going to talk to those of you who are watching at home. 
I'd need a lot more than 10 minutes to respond to what the president just said. So instead of talking about what he is saying, I'm going to highlight what Democrats are doing. After all, you can listen to what someone says, but to know the truth, watch what they do. Michiganders are no different from Americans everywhere. We love our families and want a good life today and a better life tomorrow for our kids. We work hard and we expect our government to work hard for us as well. We have grit and value loyalty and we still root for the Detroit Lions. <laughs> we and all Americans might be weary of today's politics, but we must stay engaged. Our country, our democracy, our future demand it. We're capable of great things when we work together. We cannot forget that despite the dishonesty and division of the last few years, and that we heard tonight from the President of the United States, together we have boundless potential. And young Americans are proving that every day by taking action. That's what I want to focus on tonight. Monty Scott is 13 years old and lives in Muskegon Heights, Michigan. Monty Street was covered in potholes. They were ankle deep, and he got tired of waiting for them to get fixed. So he grabbed a shovel and a bucket of dirt and filled them in himself. During my campaign, people told me to fix the damn roads because blown tires and broken windshields are downright dangerous. And car repairs take money from rent, child care or groceries. And we, the Democrats, are doing something about it. In Illinois, Governor J.B. Pritzker passed a multi-billion dollar plan to rebuild their roads and bridges. Governor Phil Murphy is replacing lead pipes in New Jersey. All across the country, Democratic leaders are rebuilding bridges, fixing roads, expanding broadband, and cleaning up drinking water. Everyone in this country benefits when we invest in infrastructure. Congressional Democrats have presented proposals to keep us moving forward, but President Trump and the Republicans in the Senate are blocking the path. When it comes to infrastructure, Monty has tried to do more with a shovel and a pile of dirt than the Republicans in D.C. have with the Oval Office and the U.S. Senate. Bullying people on Twitter doesn't fix bridges. It burns them. Our energy should be used to solve problems. And it's true for health care, too. For me, for so many Americans, health care is personal, not political. When I was 30, I became a member of the sandwich generation. That means I was sandwiched between two generations of my own family for whom I was the primary caregiver. I was holding down a new job, caring for my newborn daughter, as well as my mom at the end of her brain cancer battle. I was up all night with a baby, and during the day, I had to fight my mom's insurance company when they wrongly denied her coverage for chemotherapy. It was hard. It exposed the harsh realities of our workplaces, our health care system, and our child care system. And it changed me. I lost patience for people who are just talk and no action. So as a state senator, I worked with a Republican governor and legislature to expand health care coverage to more than 680,000 Michiganders under the Affordable Care Act. Today, Democrats from Maine to Montana are expanding coverage and lowering costs. In Kansas, Governor Laura Kelly is working across the aisle to bring Medicaid coverage to tens of thousands. In New Mexico, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham enshrined ACA protections into law. Every Democrat running for president has a plan to expand health care for all Americans. Every one of them has supported the Affordable Care Act with coverage for people with pre-existing conditions. They may have different plans, but the goal is the same. President Trump sadly has a different plan. He's asking the courts to rip those life-saving protections away. It's pretty simple. Democrats are trying to make your health care better. Republicans in Washington are trying to take it away. Think about kids like 17-year-old Blake Carroll from Idaho, who organized a fundraiser to pay for his mom's colon cancer treatment. Or 19-year-old Ebony Myers from Utah, who sells art to help pay for her own rare genetic disorder treatment. No one should have to crowdsource their health care. 
not in America. But the reality is, not everyone in America has a job with health care and benefits. In fact, many have jobs that don't even pay enough to cover their monthly expenses. It doesn't matter what the president says about the stock market. What matters is that millions of people struggle to get by or don't have enough money at the end of the month after paying for transportation, student loans, or prescription drugs. American workers are hurting. In my own state, our neighbors in Wisconsin and Ohio, Pennsylvania, and all over the country, wages have stagnated while CEO pay has skyrocketed. So when the president says the economy is strong, my question is, Strong for whom? Strong for the wealthy who are reaping rewards from tax cuts they don't need? The American economy needs to be a different kind of strong. Strong for the science teacher spending her own money to buy supplies for her classroom. Strong for the single mom picking up extra hours so she can afford her daughter's soccer cleats. Strong for the small business owner who has to make payroll at the end of the month. Michigan invented the middle class. So we know, if the economy doesn't work for working people, it just doesn't work. Who fights for working, hardworking Americans? Democrats do. In the US House, Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Democrats passed a landmark bill on equal pay, another bill to give 30 million Americans a raise by increasing the minimum wage, and groundbreaking legislation to finally give Medicare the power to negotiate lower drug prices for America's seniors and families. Those three bills and more than 275 other bipartisan bills are just gathering dust on Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's desk. Senator McConnell, America needs you to move those bills. Meanwhile, Democrats across the country are getting things done. Pennsylvania's Governor Tom Wolf is expanding the right to overtime pay. Michigan is too. Because if you're on the clock, you deserve to get paid. Nevada Governor Steve Sisolak and North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper are working to give hardworking teachers a raise. And speaking of the classroom, Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers unilaterally increased school funding by $65 million last year. In Colorado, Governor Jared Polis has enacted free all-day kindergarten. And in 29 states, we've helped pass minimum wage hikes into law, which will lift people out of poverty and improve lives for families. That's strength. That's action. Democracy takes action. And that's why I'm so inspired by young people. They respond to mass shootings, demanding policies that make schools safer. They react to a world that's literally on fire, with fire in their bellies, to push leaders to finally take action on climate change. They take on a road filled with potholes with a shovel and some dirt. It's what gives me great confidence in our future. And it's why sometimes it feels like they're the adults in the room. But it shouldn't have to be that way. It's not their mess to clean up. It's ours. The choices we make today create their reality tomorrow. Young people, I'm talking to you and your parents and grandparents. Democrats want safe schools. We want everyone to have a path to a good life, whether it's through a union apprenticeship, a community college, a four-year university, without drowning in debt. We want your water to be clean. We want you to love who you love and to live authentically as your true selves. And we want women to have autonomy over our bodies. We want our country welcoming and everyone's vote counted. 2020 is a big year. It's the year my daughter Sherry will graduate from high school. It's also the year she'll cast her first ballot along with millions of young Americans. The two things are connected. Because walking across a graduation stage is as important as walking into the voting booth for the first time. Her future, all our kids' futures, will be determined not just by their dreams, but by our actions. As we witness the impeachment process in Washington, there are some things each of us, no matter our party, should demand. The truth matters. Facts matter and no one should be above the law. It's not what those senators say. Tomorrow 
It's about what they do that matters. Remember, listen to what people say, but watch what they do. It's time for action. Generations of Americans are counting on us. Let's not let them down. Thank you for listening. God bless America. Good night. Democratic response there from the governor of Michi Michigan, Gretchen Widmer, talking about what Democrats are doing all across the country. One of basically two Democratic responses tonight, perhaps the first one, Nancy Pelosi ripping up the president's speech at the end, and then this 10-minute address from Governor Widmer right there. Matthew Dada grew up in Michigan. Pretty clear from her comments right there that health care is going to be at the heart of this campaign. Yeah, and we still do root for the Lions, even <laughs> though that's a long-suffering. I mean, the thing, fascinating thing about me in both the speeches, the president's State of the Union address and that speech, is their address on the same issues, the economy and health care, to the same people, 10,000, 11,000 people in Michigan that voted and caused the president to win, associated with the number that people that approve of the president on the economy, but disapprove him personally. It's 10% of the country that they're both sides are going for on those two specific And you saw issues. her go after the president personally there at the end. In order to undercut him personally, but not let him take credit for the economy. Let me go back to Mary Bruce, senior congressional correspondent on Capitol Hill, a little more from Speaker Pelosi after she walked out. Yeah, and George, we were just able to catch up with the speaker, and she was asked by reporters why she ripped up the president's speech, and she said because it was, quote, the courteous thing to do considering the alternative. She said it was such a dirty speech. The reaction from Democrats here leaving the chamber has been uh, that they feel that they just attended a Trump campaign rally. One top Democrat saying he was just at a MAGA rally. And there is no question this was a, a much more political in the tone and tenor than your usual State of the Union address. That was clear from the, the chant straight off the bat of four more years. Uh, if there was ever any doubt about whether this is Donald Trump's Republican Party, I think that was uh, solidified tonight when, when it became very clear throughout that Republicans are completely behind this president, even though, of course, George, over recent days we have seen a few of them, a growing number, come out and say that while not impeachable, they do feel that the president's actions uh, with regard to Ukraine were not right and were not appropriate. But the, the reaction from Democrats Democrats here overwhelming is that they feel that Donald Trump is simply uh, launching into his fall campaign here, George. No question about that. David Muir, the disdain between Donald Trump and Nancy Pelosi, uh, mutual and palpable. Yeah, really striking, George, that moment when she ripped up the script uh, as uh, half of the chamber was applauding the president uh, after her State of the Union was really something, and that's going to be uh, uh, certainly talked about, debated uh, for the hours uh, and days to come after this. So I have to tell you, uh, not only did we meet with President Trump today for that off-the-record lunch that we typically have with, uh, you know, administrations dating back uh, several of them, we also met with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, and I did ask her, uh, would she be willing uh, in this uh, final year of the first term to actually talk with President Trump to seek some sort of compromise on infrastructure prescription drug prices, which she has talked about, Senator Schumer has talked about. Uh, she hesitated, but eventually said she would be willing to talk with him and acknowledge that she hasn't talked with him since October 16th. But I have to say, George, after watching that moment, it's hard to imagine either one of them being willing to talk with one another. Doesn't look like it's going to come anytime soon. Okay, we're going to take another quick break. We'll be right back.
protesta ayudan a millones a tener Congresswoman Veronica Escobar de El Paso giving the Democrat a response in Spanish tonight. Let's talk about the night now with our political panel here with Chris Christie, Yvette Simpson, Rahm Emanuel, and, and, and Chris, let me begin with you. What's your impression? Uh, listen, the Democrats saw tonight what they're going to be up against for the next 10 months. Um, that's Donald Trump at his best. He was disciplined. As many times as they booed and heckled, he didn't respond, which we've seen him do before on a number of occasions. Couldn't help himself at the very beginning. Including that chamber. Right. But I mean, you know, he, he looked at them. He watched what they were doing. He stayed disciplined. He stayed on the speech. We were following along with the text. There were very few deviations from the text. And he laid out his argument. And he laid it out strongly and clearly and directly. And there'll be all kinds of people quibbling back and forth forth about things. That's the nature of politics today. But I, the president gets an A-plus tonight because if, and I heard this thing, it's a political speech. Of course it's a political speech. It's the beginning it's of a political year when he's running for election. Right. No, but there was some, John, I think Carl in the beginning was being a little critical about the idea that, you know, it was more political than he's ever seen. Well, I've watched a lot of first-term presidents give this speech, and it's always very political. Um, and this was political tonight, but I think the president made his case, and I think the Democrats saw the kind of campaigner they're going to run against this time, which is different than last I time. I think John's point was more about the partisan environment in the in the chamber, but I take your point as well. Yvette Simpson, it was hard to mistake, you know, especially towards the beginning, the president's uh, strong outreach towards the African-American community for, the, for that first section of the speech. You know, he knows he's doing really, really poorly with African-Americans. He's going at it. But I will tell you that that Rush Limbaugh recognition probably undercut the entire thing. I mean, when you think about what Rush Limbaugh has meant for with his racist rhetoric, I mean, I feel like he, he gives with one hand and he takes with another. You honor a Tuskegee Airman and then you honor Rush Limbaugh. Like that juxtaposition isn't lost on people. It is Black History Month and I think it was probably right of him to recognize the history of African Americans in this country. But when you honor someone like Rush Limbaugh right after honoring someone who risked his life to fight for this country, I think African Americans know better. And, and Rahm, it was pretty clear the president, where, where the president thinks the Democrats' vulnerabilities are going into 2020. The word socialism, Medicare for all, health care for illegal immigrants. Yes, yes, yes. You got it. I mean, here, here's the thing. Was he going to turn the page and look to the future, give people a sense that the country was on the move? And look, I'm not a supporter, obviously. It was an effective speech. And of course it's political. I've never wor I've worked on nine State of the Unions. Every one of them, regardless of where they come in the presidency, are political speeches. They set out the agenda. They set what your accomplishments are. And they honor America's uh, spirit and this character. He did that. Now, I do think uh, there are things that he's done like Rush Limbaugh that are gonna actually work against that grain. But in the end of the day, when you look at the people he honored, outside of Rush Limbaugh, you look at some of the policies he talked about going forward, which were more bipartisan, on child tax credit, vocational education, infrastructure bill, you go down the planting trees, you go down the list, it was let's work together, and he didn't, as I think Chris is exactly right, he didn't take the bait, and he talked about a country on the move for his goal, it's a B plus A minus. Yeah, he, he, just, he reached out to suburban yeah, America. Yeah, on the other places. hand, there's no doubt he uh, did they, reach out to suburban America tonight. He, he understands where his weaknesses are in those collar counties in Pennsylvania and some of the suburbs in Michigan and Wisconsin. Chris, that's what he needed to do tonight. He did it. The question will be going forward. It's not actually. He continue to do actually, it. here's what I think. Everybody's thinking the appeal, let's say, to African American or women. Uh, it's no. not for those groups. It's actually for his voters to feel comfortable with how he is doing. It's not that he's going to go from four percent of the African-American vote to eight or something like that. Because they know better. That's right. <laughs> but it's to make other people more comfortable with him by saying that this is a more generous person than he actually has been all year. Fundamental, it was a speech designed to get 51% of the vote. When you look at that speech, it was designed not to get 60% of the vote and rally the country behind him in a unifying way, bring the country together, it was to get 51% of the vote. And the question I think that Chris was just raising is, he did it for 78 minutes. He did a pretty good job for 78 minutes. Can he do it for the next 78 days, let alone the next 10 months. Matt, that's no, what he's no, at this stage, no. at this stage, at this stage, he can't give a 60% speech. No. You, I, when Nancy Pelosi stands there and rips up the speech, and you have members on the Democratic side looking down, paying no attention well, to it. He can give the speech. He, but he, he, it's, it would be possible to do it. You there, can't bring America there's not, together there's not in that 60 way now. In America. Well, the there's no speech is, you can give that 60 America. I, I, I disagree with that. No. I, there, there's things he could talk about that would bring the country together. They may not that, go together, that, that's, that but he could do that. Well, this parts not, of it, this parts not of it, but not the speech as a whole. One issue where he has brought... One issue where he has 
has brought Congress together, we mentioned it briefly, was criminal justice reform. Our senior justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Uh, that that is the, it was the president considered his signature bipartisan accomplishment last year. Uh, he did indeed, and that's an area where you see Democrats and Republicans in strong favor of doing more to make the criminal justice system more fair. But George, I, I must say that the divisions here were stark. Yeah. Seeing that African-American general uh, who was honored by the president tonight and then having Rush Limbaugh honored in the same way was just another reminder of just how divided the country truly is. No, no question about that. Well, the, the, the Trump campaign believes firmly that they can make some inroads in the African-American community in this upcoming election. You saw that with criminal justice reform. You saw that with school choice. Um, but to Yvette's point, eight, and ten, eight out of 10 black Americans believe that the president is racist. Nine out of 10 are not happy with his job performance. They've got a long way to go on this uh, issue. Before we go, I do want to talk a little foreign policy. Martha Raddatz, our chief global affairs anchor, also here. President put that towards the end of the speech, talking about the successes against ISIS, the killings of al-Baghdadi and General Soleimani, the Iranian and what seemed like what could be maybe a half-hearted outreach hand to the Iranians. A, a, a half-hearted attempt to reach out to the Iranians, which I doubt will work at all, because the Iranians, including the Ayatollah, have already said they will not negotiate with Donald Trump. Uh, Zarif, their foreign minister, says he does not trust Donald Trump, so there will be no negotiations. Uh, George, but uh, this speech was really larger than anything he said about foreign policy. As you know, he didn't mention North Korea at all, and that, that could be a real problem for him in the coming years, but this really was a gift to Republicans. It was Donald Trump measured, weaving an incredible story with a lot of heroes involved. It was, that was very skillfully done. There's no question about that. Martha, thanks very much. We're going to take another quick break. We'll be right back. ABC. Show all the time. Oh. 